Well, welcome to The Stump, a podcast about forestry and other topics that I find of interest. And today we have Lloyd McGee with us. And uh, Lloyd, glad you could join The Stump today. And uh, hopefully, I I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation. Um, For those who don't know Lloyd, he has a, a very interesting career and story and i met him actually a long time ago he may not remember through the ag forestry program uh when Vaughan brothers lumber hosted my class over in colville for a evening reception um but mostly i've worked with him on collaboratives around the state and so uh with that lloyd i'll i'll turn it over to you all right thank you matt yeah i'm Really proud and honored and uh, appreciate being one of your initial uh, subjects. And I've seen uh, your other podcasts and I'm really impressed with what you're doing with this. And I think you got a lot of good future, um, you know, presentations to look forward to. And so I'm going to follow you and and uh, yeah, good work there. And, and thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you. And I think, you know, we before we hit record here, I we kind of talked about, I think, you felt that the best way to maybe kind of rather than just listing off your, your resume, which, you know, can be a little bit, you know, just (laughs) listing things off. Yeah. You know, it's an impressive resume, but can be a little dry, dry, just listing it off that, that you have a a story you'd like to tell. And so I just, I'm just going to sit back, listen. I may jump in if there's a certain point, uh, you know, there's something that really strikes me, but mostly I just, I think, people hearing your story, I think will hopefully inspire and maybe even, uh, you know, get somebody to want to come and check out what this thing called forestry is. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're right. I really had to think about it. And, uh, I like the idea of telling more of a life story and how my career fits into that. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a little bit of drama (laughs) and, uh, you know, I hope to, you know, keep it light enough that we can all enjoy the, the, the ride. And uh, so I'll just jump right into it. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, So, you know, I, um, I'll just start with, I I was a bottle fed baby. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I'm not going to go back that far, but I am going to go back pretty far. I'm going to go back to um, when I was two through six years old. And I was living in Sandpoint, Idaho, and that was with my mother and my father. My my father, my dad, he was a Methodist minister in downtown Sandpoint, and uh, he had a, a church right there on 4th Street. And uh, Sandpoint, if anybody doesn't know, is just a gorgeous town right on the shores, uh, the north end of Lake Pend Oreille. And it is surrounded by mountains and forests. It's the um, the Panhandle National Forest. And uh, my first recollections in Sandpoint was playing outside and those big log trucks would just come burrowing into town, you know, with that that Jake brake sound just And it was scary. I mean, they they had their big grills, you know, that just looked like monsters. And I was scared to death of those log trucks. And uh, I'd go hide. (laughs) And uh, but that was the town that Sandpoint was back in those days. It was a logging town. It was a, you know, natural resource town. And, uh, you know, I I just enjoyed living there. And, uh, you know, my story will come back to that here after a while. But um, my father got transferred to Seattle, Washington in downtown Seattle, First Methodist Church there. And uh, we lived in Magnolia Bluff. And we'd come into town for church all the time. And, you know, I was a PK, a preacher's kid. So there are a lot of expectations on a preacher's kid. You got to be exceptional. And and you know what? I didn't like it. (laughs) You know, I just wanted to be a kid. And I was somewhat of a troublemaker. I kind of made a point of that, I think, Uh, you know, so I didn't have to have so much pressure. But, um, you know, in Seattle, it was really cool because we moved there right when the World's Fair was you know, in town and and getting going and actually watched the Space Needle being erected. And uh, that was quite a 
uh, a thrilling you know time that I remember. Um, and by the time I was uh, in sixth grade, um, you know, I had been in the sixth grade for you know a couple months, and I had been elected president of you know the sixth grade <laughs> uh, class, and you know all that meant was when the teacher left the room. Um, I would go to the front of your room and make sure the kids are good until she got back. That's what a president did, you know? So, you know, but uh, all of a sudden my dad comes into the house and says, Hey, you know, I think we're going to be transferred to Glendale, California. And I was going, Oh, wait a second. I got all these friends, you know, and I'm doing good in sixth grade. I, you know, I didn't want to move, but anyway, kicking and screaming, we moved to Glendale and Glendale, if anybody doesn't know, it's between Burbank, Pasadena, Hollywood, Los Angeles, yeah. And uh, so there we were, you know, uh, in Glendale, California, you know, before just for Christmas and uh, it's 85 degrees, you know, 85 degrees on Christmas Day. Went to Malibu Beach and watched the surfers. Uh, it was weird, you know, for me. But uh, after, you know, being in Seattle and sometimes snow and rain and whatnot. But um, yeah, Glendale was where I had to finish up sixth grade and I had to make new friends. And, and uh, then, you know, I had to join Little League. I had been in Little League nine through 11 years old in Seattle. And, and uh, my dad had been really working with me and as a pitcher and I was a left-handed pitcher. He was a left-handed pitcher when he was a kid. And uh, when he was growing up, he, was, he went all the way through college playing baseball. So that is what we had as a bond. And uh, he would take me out and, you know, work with me all the time. And anyway, so there I was um, uh, on a Thursday on June 28th, and it was the beginning of summer vacation. And my dad and, and I were practicing baseball, and then she, he just wasn't feeling well. And so we uh, went home, and he went and laid down, and uh, suddenly my mom comes running out. Um, Your dad's having a heart attack. And to make a long story short, um, you know, he did not survive the ambulance ride. And uh, so I was riding in my cousin's car behind the ambulance. My mom was in the ambulance and she comes running out when I got there and she throws her arms around me and she just says, he's gone. And I, as a 12 year old, I'm going, he's gone where? Gone where? And she says, he didn't make it. And that is what I had to accept. And my mom and I had just been in Glendale for eight months. And all of a sudden, it's just her and I. I didn't have any brothers or sisters. And so we had to make a tough choice. You know, what would we do? Would we move back to my mom's family in Louisville, Kentucky, which would be really different? I didn't want to do that. And so she and I decided, and thank, thankfully, I thank her for this. She let me have a choice. And we stayed in Glendale. So I did uh, go through um, Glendale High School there. And uh, at that time, uh, you can imagine I was uh, devastated, losing my, my best friend, my dad, my mentor. Um, I was no longer an important person as a PK. I'm just another kid. And my mom no longer was a, a preacher's wife. Um, she was actually... Um, stuck, you know, getting another job as she had been a housewife for so long, 14 years. And all of a sudden now this is what she has to live with. So I, I felt for her. Um, but anyway, um, I was kind of a rebellious kid because I, I felt abandoned. And that's a key, a key point that I want to make later in my story. But I felt abandoned and, um, you know, mad at God, whoever. You can imagine, Matt, what that might have been like. Um, and so I, you know, started kind of rebelling more, even though my mom tried to do everything she could for me. And, you know, I went to lots of rock concerts in LA, you know, and I'd see Led Zeppelin and, you know, the who and Pink Floyd and, and, uh, you know, Rolling Stone, Santana, I saw all these bands and it was all great. And I appreciated, you know, having that freedom in some ways. Um, but what was really drawing me is I would go up into the mountains of Angeles Crest, Angeles Crest National Forest. And, and I just felt at peace up there. And that, that became my church, you know, and there was a song by the Moody Blues. Anybody might know it, but 
this this one lyric it goes um the trees are drawing me near i've got to find out why and that just stuck in my head and that became kind of my thing to figure out um i i had to figure out a career and uh I had to think about what my career would be like. And it's definitely not going to be a singer. Obviously I wasn't going to be a rock singer. <laughs> you could tell that Matt. <laughs> so I realized I better think about what I want to do working with trees. And, uh, but also a very important point for me is, you know, why did my, my dad have a heart attack at, at 55 years old? You know, and I realized, I think it was all the stress. I mean, working in a church, you know, and bringing all those people together, and having to deal with all the diverse problems, you know, and the highs and lows of, of you know, funerals and, and weddings and, you know, going to hospitals and, and visiting and bringing people around, building trust, building faith in people, you know, and, and building that common ground for everybody. Um, it, it was, it must have been overwhelming for him. And uh, anyway, he didn't make it. And uh you know, past 55. And I, I always hope I could make it past 55, you know, <laughs> we'll see what I, you know, inherited. But anyway, um, so I realized, okay, I want to get into forestry. I want to get up, you know, uh, work in some sort of um, forestry career. And, and what that would do for me, it would get me away from people that put stress on you. And I would get up in the woods and I would be, you know, doing nature hikes every day, you know, marking timber, cruising timber, you know, running boundary lines, you know, just away from everybody and, and letting nature, you know, heal me up and, and you know, just be, be more at peace of, with my career. So I love that idea, and, but, but I did not want to stay in Glendale. I wanted to get away from the smog. Have you ever been down there and seen the smog? And, you know, it's better now than it was then. But I wanted to get away from the smog and all the people. So um, after a little time after high school, my friend and I, we packed our backpacks and our sleeping bag. And we hitchhiked because that's how I got around everywhere. You know, I hitchhiked and uh, hitchhiked up the Pacific Coast Highway up into Canada. And then we went east and hitchhiked across to where we were above Idaho. And we dropped down into Sandpoint, Idaho. And I just felt like I had returned to my roots. And I'm going, I love it here. And I decided to stay. And uh, I got on with the Sandpoint Ranger District of the Panhandle National Forest. And I did some great work there that I just really enjoyed. I mean, it was everything from recreation um, to working with um, stand exams, collecting data and, you know, burning slash piles, whatever. It was, it was all good, you know, working outdoors. And um, I decided I'm going to go to college for this. So I went to North Idaho College in, in Coeur d'Alene. And you, you've seen maybe North Idaho College before. I mean, it's right on the shores of Coeur d'Alene Lake, and that's just gorgeous too. So I, I love being there. And then I went on to University of Idaho and uh, ended up getting a degree in uh, forest resource management and then another degree in forest products business management. And uh, I had done all of these seasonal jobs during the summers and, you know, working for the school forest. U of I had a 7,000 acre school forest, great experience there. But now, you know, I have a wife and a son, my, my one of uh, two sons and a daughter overall, but that was our, my first son there while I was going to college. I needed a permanent job. And when you think about it, you know, how many professions do you have to think about a, a permanent job? What is a permanent? You know, all it meant is you're not working seasonal anymore. So that was a big hurdle, you know, to get a job where you can work year round. And uh, that opportunity came to me with the state of Idaho Department of Lands. And we moved to St. Mary's, Idaho. And uh, I really, you know, enjoyed that job. But boy, it was a lot of pressure because they kind of throw you to the wolves. Um, I worked on, uh, you know, in climbing the ladder, so to speak, you know, and became a resource manager and ultimately a senior resource manager, which means you had to jump through a lot of hoops, you know, a lot of your training and experience. But ultimately, I was managing two 35,000 acre units and doing every kind of forestry under the sun you can imagine. I mean, you know, laying out timber sales and laying out the roads and and uh, selling the sales and, and administering the road building, administering the, the timber sales and, and uh, 
putting together tree planting contracts and pre-commercial thinning contracts. Um, and, and I really, you know, loved the work, but also it wasn't easy. I, it was, it was a struggle, you know, cause you're kind of over your head in some ways and the contractors may know more than you do sometimes. <laughs> and that's a challenge, you know, um, you know, but I had to be humble about it, even though I, I was the administrator, you know? So I started watching something happening in our in our field and that was what we call the timber wars and the timber wars you know what i'm talking about matt oh <laughs> it, it most definitely <laughs> you know it became the thing where you know um industry the forest products industry and what we called back then environmentalists you know which are conservationists now but the environmentalists were you know, appealing and litigating all of the timber sales by the, the U.S. Forest Service pretty much all around the country, uh, mainly because uh, there was way too much clear cutting and over harvesting. You know, you, this is, you know, obviously very controversial, but, you know, too much road building, um, you know, and, and not enough set aside of land for future and so forth. And so basically the um, industry and the sawmills were just running out of logs. They weren't getting any more logs from the Forest Service. And so I realized, okay, working with the state of Idaho, I'm thinking our, our sales are slowing down too. I need to get into cons, uh, forest consulting with private non-industrial landowners because they are taking all the, the pressure to produce the saw logs that used to be produced by the Forest Service. So they were filling the gap. But I was watching and private landowners over harvest. And that's, that was my opinion. Uh, but I was thinking whatever is going on here on private lands, it's not sustainable. And so I got on uh, with North Country Forest Resources in Coeur d'Alene and um, was working with all the private landowners and helping them um, with forest plans and then helping to develop uh, timber sales on their property and bringing in the, the loggers that I thought would do the best job for them and overseeing it. And I was enjoying that work and I did it for a few years. And then I got to thinking, you know what, if I'm going to help private landowners, I could do it just as much justice by working for a uh, sawmill, a timber company and buying logs trying to give them the best deal and, and the mill the best deal at the same time, kind of being a broker there and, um, you know, helping them get their timber managed sustainably. So I got in with Boggan Brothers Lumber Company and I was really fortunate to get that job. Great place to work. Um, I became their small log specialist. <laughs> and, uh, you know, small logs are, um, you know, four and a half inch top, you know, these little four and a half inch top logs, we're making two by fours, you know, two, two by fours out of every log like that. You get two or 300 logs like that on a, uh, on a log truck. And so what we were doing is something I felt good about. We're thinning from below. We're removing, you know, the, the um, suppressed trees and leaving the biggest and the best trees. And I felt like that's something I could sell to private landowners and feel good about it. And uh, so I continued working with private landowners. Now, the important point here was that the Boggan Brothers Sawmill in, in Cawville was fortunate enough to be located in a, an, an area where there was 450,000 acres of private non-industrial timber owners. And, you know, they could supplement all the wood that they needed that used to get from the Cawville National Forest, you know, from these private landowners. But again, it, it's, it ha it's not sustainable. And uh, so uh, something happened in 2001, and that was the Republic Sawmill, Boggan Brothers, was totally running out of logs. And that sawmill was not fortunate enough to be surrounded by private non-industrial landowners or state lands. They mostly were surrounded by um, the Cabo National Forest and, and the Republic Ranger District. And, you know, Dwayne Vaughan, the owner of Wagen Brothers Lumber Company had to face a really difficult decision. And I'm sure it kept him up at night for you know, many nights in which, you know, he really cared about his personnel and his people that worked for him, but they had to shut down that plant permanently. 
And as AFRC, Matt, you've seen shutdowns all over, uh, you know, the Western U.S. And, and it's a big deal. And for me, it was quite an experience because I was, I was also buying logs for the Republic plant, but it just was at a point where not enough supply and, um, you know, there, there just really wasn't enough funding or profit to be able to keep the equipment um, from being antiquated, you know, keeping, keeping them upgraded. And so it was more than just wood supply. So I wouldn't just say it was the Forest Service's fault or anything like that. All I'm saying is, you know, decisions have to be made from a, a business standpoint. And it was, you know, so unfortunate. And um, you can imagine it was devastating for the, the town and the communities around Republic. And it became a, a major issue that ended up having to have a town hall meeting because with 150 employees for Vaughn Brothers being laid off and their spouses who also worked in the community and all of them basically thinking, okay, we're going to have to move away to find work. And then you think about all the service workers, you know, for the communities and for the town and, you know, the county that got laid off because so many taxpayers were leaving the county and it was devastating. So the town hall meeting, we actually uh, brought in um, the undersecretary of agriculture, Mark Ray from Washington, D.C. And he basically spoke for the Forest Service. And of course, the community was, you know, asking the question, why is the Forest Service allowing, you know, this mill to go down? Why can't you do something, you know, by, by producing more wood supply and so forth? And uh, Mark Ray did a great job of just, you know, bringing the, the story to life so people can understand the circumstances. It was about litigation and it was about appeals and projects being being stopped. And at the same time, the Republic Ranger District was remodeling their office complex with it's a log uh, structure with lots of wood products in the structure. And the irony of the federal government increasing and investing when the last sawmill in the county in the, in the region was disappearing and all these people were having to leave town, you know, that was very upsetting. You can imagine that, you know, just the irony of it. And uh, there was even death threats against environmentalists, you know, the local ones. And and I'd, I'd be out there touring with them on, on some things and come back and they're all four tires are on their car flat. I mean, I can only imagine how they must have felt. So obviously nobody was winning these timber wars. Everybody was hurting and something had to change. And, and that's where, you know, I give Dwayne Vaughan a lot of credit. Um, he really thought about what can be different that we can, you know, improve the situation. And uh, he reached out to Mike Peterson of the Lands Council uh, in Spokane as the director and Tim Coleman as the director of the Kettle Range Conservation Group. And he says, you know, we have got to find a way to work together. So he wanted to build the bridge, you know, and extend an olive branch. And they had a discussion and, you know, the common ground that they had. And, and Dwayne had me, you know, be a part of this discussion. I appreciated that, you know, and, and I was tracking all this. And um, the conclusion they kind of came up with is, you know, if, you know, industry would support some wilderness designation, I mean, some wilderness, maybe even a wilderness bill. Um, and if we could get away from clear cuts and major road construction into the roadless areas, and you know, what we call the potential wilderness areas, um, you know, we could get away from appeals and litigation. And that sounded pretty good. And, uh, we formed the, the Northeast Washington Forestry Coalition. And we invited other participants and partners. We ended up uh, filing for a 501c3 nonprofit uh, designation. And, and we had to have a president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer, and a, and a board of directors. We ended up with about 10 or 12 partners on the board of directors. and. And I was kind of designated the president of the Northeast Washington Forestry Coalition. This is in 2002. And at that time, 
nobody really had a model or, or a template of what a, a collaborative looks like. So we were just winging it, <laughs> but we were trying to find, you know, you can imagine, you know, we were just trying to, to find what our common ground was. And uh, we started working with the Kabul Nas Forest. They were very you know, inviting and they worked with us. And, and we started looking at how to design uh, treatments that were, you know, thinnings, thinnings from below, using mechanical harvesters, forgers, you know, that kind of work, um, you know, being able to, um, you know, purchase these sales and, and Boggan Brothers only needing the smaller logs. They were selling the bigger logs to, to Boise Cascade and to Plum Creek and, and Cedar to Columbia Cedar. And um, it we started actually working together as, as an integrated forest products infrastructure, getting the right logs to the right mill rather than, you know, competing against each other. And uh, so by 2005, we had increased acres treated significantly and, and we got to about 18 million board feet sold that that year on the Cobble Nasta Forest. And, and, you know, that's a lot better than zero. <laughs> and uh, but by 2008, we had uh, uh, gotten to much more acres treated and 62 million board feet annually that that year 2008 but then you know how that goes i mean here comes the great recession and the great recession kicked in after 2008 and, and you know the forest service had their budgets cut and so forth so we as a collaborative kept working together how can we be more efficient with the funds we have and so forth but i think we kept the, the annual harvest at around 40 million um you know and and uh you know by 2012 they you know came out of the recession and and things really kicked in but for me, um, in 2010, we were applying for what we call the CFLR or the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Grant, which is a 10 year grant that could be a million or $2 million of extra funding for the Cobble National Forest. And we put in a great, um, a, a great proposal. And that proposal was uh, what we called um, 2020 Vision because it was going to go from 2010 to 2020. And so we call it 2020 vision, <laughs> kind of catchy. Yes. <laughs> and, and we did, we didn't get the grant and we didn't understand, you know, what went wrong here. And so we looked into the other 10 forests that, that had received, you know, the, the grant funding and, you know, won the proposal and, and uh, dang it. <laughs> uh, we recognize eight out of the 10, you know, had been represented by the Nature Conservancy, who had a lot to do with, you know, conceiving the the CFLR grant funding. And we thought, uh oh, okay, we need to reach out to the Nature Conservancy and get them on our collaborative. It only made sense. And, you know, they worked out of Seattle, Washington. So we reached out. Um, and what we heard back from the Nature Conservancy was that they really didn't have the bandwidth to work clear over in Northeast Washington. Um, and, and we had to accept that, but a few, uh, a few weeks later, somebody reached out to me and within the nature conservancy and said, we have a position open in, uh, Wenatchee, Washington. And, you know, you, you might think about applying for it, you know, and then maybe you can extend the bandwidth to Northeast Washington with your experience out there. And, and they wanted somebody who could bring the, the forest products infrastructure back to central Washington which sounds like a, you know, big undertaking, but I thought, okay, you know, my industry experience, you know, 18 years with Vaughan Brothers Lumber Company and all I've learned about our industry. And I thought maybe I could, you know, be a good candidate for that position. And I thought, why not mix up my career? I mean, I've done everything else in my mind. You know, I, I worked for federal and state agencies and I was a uh, consulting forester and I worked for forest products industry and and why not conservation? You know, I and that kind of rounded me out. I'm going to hear new perspectives, and I'm not going to be preaching to the choir anymore. And so I I, I embrace that. And so I applied for the job, and uh, uh, through the interview process, I learned a lot about TNC, and I was really impressed. And um, I was offered the job, and and uh, I moved to Wenatchee, and uh, I uh, really was excited about working for a nonprofit organization, especially of that caliber, you know, all around the world. They've got 
the Nature Conservancy works in over 70 countries around the world and every state in the United States and, you know, lots of science, uh, you know, to, to glean from. And so I was excited about that. And I already established a good rapport with my conservation partners because I used to have this in the timber wars. I used to have this um, th this notion that environmentalists are just a bunch of emotional people that love to hug trees. And boy, did boy was I wrong about that. <laughs> you know, their science background and you know that what they brought to the table was just what I needed to learn. And and so working for TNC, you know, now I get to even be more of a part, part of that and, and bring that back to the table to collaboratives. So in 2013, you know, I, I started in 2011. By 2013, working with partners, we started the North Central Washington Forest Health Collaborative. And uh, that was um, basically modeling the Northeast Washington Forestry Coalition, but we also gleaned some good ideas from other collaboratives that had sprung up you know, recently. And uh, I thought we had a pretty good structure and organization there. And we started with eight partners, you know, eight good uh, collaborative um, uh, partners that uh, had the same desire to increase pace and scale of the forest restoration on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest. And that national forest is 4 million acres. The Kabul National Forest is a million acres. So there's 5 million acres that, that we can influence. And uh, we really created a good bond with the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest and their leadership. And we um, worked on restoration projects uh, we supported what the forest had already uh, created with um, the Pacific Northwest Fire Science Lab, which was the forest restoration strategy, which was all science-based ecological restoration. And uh, as a collaborative, we supported that and had to learn more about it. <laughs> you know, it was a big learning curve on that. And uh, so I became right away kind of elected from the get-go um, a co-chair of the collaborative. And we decided to have two chairs rather than just one. That way we had the diversity of perspective and leadership. And, and so I was a co-chair and Paul Ward from the Yakima Nation was the other co-chair. And uh, we all worked together and um, worked on some major restoration projects and prioritized landscapes because we were having major fire situations you know across central washington and we were losing you know hundreds of thousands of acres um sometimes just in one season and so it was really about fuel reduction and trying to get our forests back into a healthier resilient state and, and um we worked on projects like that um all the way until now and uh, but by 2017 or no, 2019, I guess it was, because it was seven years I was co-chair. I decided, you know, Nature Conservancy also encouraged me to take a step back and and let somebody else be a co-chair. Um, you know, let somebody else have some of the fun. Why should I hog all the fun, you know? <laughs> and so I stepped back and 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 uh, started working on, you know, where the barriers were and, you know, for collaboration and trying to solve some some issues and you know, be more specific on the work I did. And uh, I've been doing that ever since. And I've really en enjoyed that. Um, but I've got to say something about a couple of awards I won. And this is not to, 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 to shine myself up here. But all I'm trying to say is I, I won a collaborative um, leadership award in 2017. And that was uh, with the Pacific Northwest uh, Collaborative Network. It was at a uh, Mount, uh, I was Hood River, and, and we had 25 collaboratives from Oregon and nine collaboratives from Washington. And and um, I was excited to win that award um, and uh, humbled. <laughs> and, you know, you can't, you can't say you did it because you had so many partners that bring you along. And um, so I embraced that award and thought back about, about an award I had won in 2009, and that was from the Society of American Foresters, the Inland Empire Chapter, Forester of the Year. And apparently I got that award because of my collaborative leadership 
with the Northeast Washington Forestry Coalition. So as I look back on those two awards, you know, that's not a lot. I'm just saying um, that I was uh, realizing that all the career work I had done in forestry, I'd never gotten any real recognition until I got into collaboration. And I had a few people would ask, you know, where, where do you get the passion that you have for collaboration? Where does that passion come from? You know, and, and where'd you get the skills? I mean, you think about universities, they weren't teaching collaboration. They weren't teaching, especially in my day, they weren't teaching how to the art of negotiation, you know, and bringing people together. And, and I had to think about that. And I realized that it was just inside of me. And I realized I was doing what my father had done with churches. He, my father, my dad was bringing people together and of all diversities and doing the highs and lows and working through these things and, you know, very stressful situations, which collaboration can be. And here I am. The, if you remember what I was saying before, I was going to get as far away from people and work in the back country and stay away from all that stress. And yet here I am, you know, right back, made the full circle and I'm working with people, bringing them together, trying to find common ground with them and, and, and so many good partners. And I realized, you know what? I got that from my dad. And then all of a sudden I had an epiphany and it was that, my dad has never abandoned me. He never abandoned me. He was right there with me and all this time. And all of a sudden, I just felt this weight come off of me. The stress of that was gone. Suddenly, I understood that I, I'm doing what is in my blood. And so because of that, I really am appreciative of being able to have the opportunity and the Nature Conservancy, what they've given me, you know, and armed me with, with, you know, good resources to just participate with all these good people that, that I've grown to really, um, really want to get together with. And especially the diversity within the North Central Collaborative, 22 member organizations, there's so much diversity. The hardest part is finding consensus and supporting forest restoration strategy together, but it's been the most meaningful work I've ever done. And so I would like to just say, if I can recommend to young people getting into natural resources, we need you. We need, you know, young people being involved and, you know, participating at the tables and getting your perspectives out there. And, and you know, the forestry, any type of natural resource work is, very rewarding and worth having a career in you'll never get rich <laughs> you know <laughs> however if that's not your biggest goal i mean if you want a satisfying career natural resources of any type is is worth getting into you know i i, I think i'll stop there matt and you know just uh you know talk about anything anything more specific you'd like to get into yeah no <clears throat> thank you lloyd i i had little bits and pieces of your story, I guess, you know, from working with you and getting to know you over time. But um, that was fascinating and not at all what I expected. Um, so I'm <laughs> glad that you didn't share uh, any kind of an outline ahead. I, you know, I was kind of just, I was always waiting for the next, you know, kind of the next segment. So um, I think one interesting thing that, you know, I, when I started really kind of into the role I'm now in and working more with you. Um, one thing I always remember you, you mentioning in various settings is trying to work from your values versus your positions. And oh, I, yeah. I, you know, and I, I think that that's a, that's something that's really critical when you're trying to do this collaborative work. Cause for those who are watching this and don't know me well, I'm, I'm also involved in several collaboratives around the state of Washington. And, you know, I, I really think that's the key to finding that common ground that you talk about, because I think at the end of the day, whether you're, you know, a log buyer, 
a fisherman, a recreationist, you know, a fish bio, whatever. At the end of the day, you know, we all really kind of want the same things. We want a clean, safe environment. We want good schools for our kids. We want a safe place to live. We want a safe place for our families. And I think, you know, that that's a, I think that's a very valuable lesson, um, you know, to me to kind of take away is that, and, and really kind of what you really pointed out, I think in your, your life story there of wanting to get away from people, but this is still really about people in the end. <laughs> you know and so so i think you know i i'm kind of just a little loss of words honestly after listening to your story but um i i guess for kind of some you know i've interacted with you and others at tnc about bringing infrastructure back i've seen what's happened to rural communities as the northwest forest plan and other issues around the forest service has driven volume down but what what do you see is say the the biggest opportunities for collaboratives and really for the what I would say is the the business side of forestry and forest restoration work because you know it, it's not just the sawmills and it's not just the loggers or the truck drivers but it's the people out there that are you know looking at water resources and fish passage and that kind of, you know, work. And it's the, the whole fabric of many of these small rural communities, you know, you got to have still have some kind of an economic engine that keeps the lights on in the local restaurants when the tourists are not there and those type of things. So what do you see as kind of the biggest opportunities? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, what you talked about really teed it up when you talked about um, positions compared to, um, you know, interests and, and uh, you know, really when you get together as, you know, such diverse folks work, working collaboratively and trying to solve, you know, the, the forest restoration uh, challenges, um, you know, the first thing that you got to do is we all got to kind of put, check our guns the, at the door. That's coming from the timber wars, you know, perspective. You know, I mean, our positions that were our weapons in those days. You know, my position was, you know, um, I'm, I'm anti logging, you know, or I'm anti wilderness or I'm anti, you know, uh, anything, you know, that that's your position. And, and then you defend it to the hilt, you know. But if you start talking about I'm interested interested in seeing clean water. I want to see strong fisheries. I want to uh, support um, thinnings, you know, to um, alleviate catastrophic wildfire and get our natural fires back into their natural sizes and being able to manage them. I, I, I want to work with, um, I want to work with a certain amount of land that can be set aside for the future. I, you know, we start finding that we have common ground, we have common interests and, uh, you know, and, and then we start saying, okay, well, what do we want to work on together? And then you start building what we call, you know, guiding principles or zones of agreement. And, and then the Forest Service knows what to expect from us and, and what they can expect support, you know, on and, and from. And so when we talk about, you know, the, the opportunities, you know, for, um, you know, woods workers and, and the opportunities for the economic engine and so forth, we got to start from the perspective that, you really need woods workers and we need the, the forest products industry and the sawmills because who's going to do all of this great work that's been spent millions and millions of dollars on planning. You can plan to the hilt and until something changes on the ground, you have the same risks and the same wildfire problems that, that you always had until something changes on the ground. And then once you have the plan, you got to get somebody to do it and you got to pay them and you got to pay them a good wage to get a good job done, you know, and, and uh, that becomes how you support communities. And unfortunately, when um, you lose all the sawmill infrastructure from the timber wars, like we did in central Washington, um, we have one sawmill left and that's Yakima forest products down, down in white Swan. 
they get, you know, up until recently, they had been getting a lot of their timber off of their own uh, tribal lands. And so they didn't really have such a demand at all for forest service projects until recently. Um, so how do we bring infrastructure back to central Washington? Right now we have kind of a rub in, in the industry that we have to th think about at least. And that is that we have to support the existing sawmills before we start trying to bring new innovative sawmills, you know, to, to central Washington. So we've been really working as a collaborative to increase the wood basket from byproduct um, timber from the good ecological restoration we're doing. We're not chasing volume. We're not trying to build up the wood supply by over harvesting. We're trying to just treat more acres in a responsible ecological way. And the byproduct will be an increased wood supply. And at least if we can support the existing mills, but the problem is the existing mills are like 150 miles away, at least, you know, over in Western Washington or up in Colville uh, or even Northeast Oregon. And, uh, I guess, you know, that's fine to uh, sell the sales and, and truck them that far, but everything is going up and all the, you know, the profits going up in diesel smoke, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and I think that that's an interesting challenge that, you know, as I think about collaboration and I just, I think about the industry, the benefits it provides, um, I guess to me, one thing I've been thinking a lot about lately is looking at the entire system. You know, this, we're recording this here in early the first week of April, and we've already, since the first year, have seen two facilities in western Montana close, four now, unfortunately, down in Oregon. And it, it feels like we're in this weird society where we want to do good things with wood, we want to build with wood, we want to make sure that we reduce wildfire and insect and disease so long as a very small noisy part of the population is happy at not cutting trees i don't know it, it it's a weird uh dynamic right now and so i i think it'll be interesting to see how collaboration can move move forward and look at the bigger picture um of impact so that we don't so we don't get into another situation where we need infrastructure in certain landscapes, but we're still the challenge of providing the, the basic materials needed to recruit that infrastructure. But I was wondering if you could yeah. speak a little bit to one thing that I've really noticed in the collabors I'm engaged in. We, we've become... Um, you know, I, I'm not making a, a value judgment of, you know, right or wrong here, but we've really become the, the continuity in many of these ranger districts working with the Forest Service. Um, you know, I, I think the Okanagan Wenatchee, they, they have honestly probably the best staff I have seen in the, the 10 years that I've worked with that forest. Um, but they've also had what five four supervisors in that 10 years i think and you know and seeing the same things happen on other forests other ranger districts and i i feel like we're getting really good kind of field level staff and stuff but how how do you see the collabors not only that continuity but in many ways kind of providing leadership i guess yeah Okay, wonderful uh, topic here that can go on for a long time. Uh, but, you know, my comments on that are, one, um, you're right, the Okanagan Natchee Nass Forest has got, you know, great staffing. We we got, you know, the Central Washington Initiative funding from the the infrastructure funding bill and, you know, 102 million. Uh, now we got another 20 million for that. So we got $122 million to spend on forest restoration and bringing in new personnel and, and filling the gaps, you know, for the personnel and, and, a and, and a planning team and so forth. And so, um, we are in a pretty good position, but we just lost our forest supervisor. We're now, you know, trying to hire a new forest supervisor and this, uh, turnover, um, of staffing, uh, is kind of part of the culture of the national forest you know system and what they do is they you know uh allow uh other uh transfers or uh 
allow their staff to be able to um, freely apply for any positions they want across the country. And when they leave and move on or become interims to fill other slots, you know, then, then, you know, you, you've lost some of the relationships that you've built through collaboration and you've got to start over. And sometimes as, as collaborative partners who, you know, I've been at the nature conservancy now for 13 years and, you know, we have now become, you know, the, the institutional memory. And so when we do lose a forest supervisor or anyone of, of leadership, you know, we need to make sure that there's a, um, some sort of transferal letter, you know, from transitional letter that, you know, goes from the forest supervisor to the new forest supervisor and highlights, you know, what the relationships are and what the, the plans are so that we kind of stay on course. And uh, one thing that we developed within our North Central Collaborative, I shortened the name North Central because <laughs> North Central Washington Forest Health Collaborative is a mouthful. Um, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, we created what we call the collaborative engagement framework, and that is how we will engage the collaboratives with the Forest Service leadership and staff, and and what we developed uh, is our agreements on each project, so we call them collaborative engagement agreements, and those agreements um, highlight the touch points along a project's timeline in which the collaborative and the, the staff will engage on, on key moments like landscape evaluation. You know, that's a key moment when the landscape evaluation is developed and the landscape prescriptions and then the purpose and need and then the proposed action and then the draft NEPA and so forth. Uh, there's touch points and, and maybe it might have to do with some field trips as well. Um, and those touch points are when we engage and then when we don't engage, that's when the collaborative steps back and lets the Forest Service do their work so that we don't keep bombarding them with requests for maps and requests for information at all times during the length, because that interferes with the Forest Service's progress. And so I, I, I like to think that a collaborative engagement framework can be passed on from one forest supervisor to the next and we keep on moving working together that way rather than the a new forest supervisor a new somebody comes in and changes the way we do business and that's why i say the institutional memory of what we've agreed to do let's keep that you know intact while we're moving forward no i i think that's great and i you know i i think you you hit on some very key points that i think many of the collaboratives around you know, the Pacific Northwest, but particularly here in Washington, you know, I, I think some of us have kind of started down that path, but I think some of us can probably step up our pace down that path of how do we really create that that transition framework as leadership comes and goes within the Forest Service. But um, I, I was going to go someplace else, but a, a thought hit me as you were talking and I, I kind of take this back to, you know, your, your story and your story about what your father taught you and, you know, this whole thing around trying to also, you know, about people and the idea of trying to also bring newer people, younger people into, you know, collaboration into forestry, natural resources, science. I, I guess I, I feel like, you know, having kids who are in their late teens, early 20s, myself, um, the type of work that we do, I, I feel that stress almost every day um, that you were talking <laughs> yeah. about. Um, but part of that's just my personality. Um, I take a lot of that on very personally. But I guess, you know, we hear a lot about crises, the climate crisis, the wildfire crisis. And if I was a kid these days, I'd be depressed. <laughs> and I guess to me, natural resources, I mean, me having grown up in an urban environment in Seattle, in Magnolia of all places, so we almost crossed oh. paths just a few years apart. Yeah. Um, I, I guess to me, that would be something that I would it'd be interested in getting kind of your thoughts on is how young people today getting involved in collaboration, realizing this is for the long term, 
it is about people and building trust between people. And oftentimes people that you may not agree with on maybe even 80% of the things, but there's still 20%. But I guess I'm kind of rambling here, but I'm, I'm trying to, I guess what I'm trying to do is, is highlight I I know how, going. <laughs> how young people coming into this, into natural resources, it can be not only a career, but a life that not only gives them, but gives society, I guess, more positive influence, more hope, rather than always hearing about the latest crises. Yeah. And, you know, you're right we and and our news media you know ingrains this in us it's always about negativity it's always about you know this crisis that crisis everything's you know gonna gonna go to hell in a handbasket so to speak you know uh i i think that's how you get people's attention anymore you know and and you know the young people these days and the all of the um you know the the computer age and you know working and all the you know, working with, uh, you know, the, just all the technology and our phones and the, the games, all of that for young people really come down to, you know, less than a five minute uh, window of attention. You know, I mean, if you can get uh, any of our attention, you know, uh, for more than three minutes, uh, just like this podcast, you know, we're taking a lot of people's time and, you know, can you focus on on something like we're talking about for more than three minutes before we got to move on this, you know, to to some other thing, because, uh, that's how our you know technology has has trained us, and and so um, I think I'm trying to answer your question by saying that if we can find the right young people, you know, in college, like I've been working with um, the Wenatchee Valley College and the Natural Resource Department, and Mike Lesky is is uh, you know uh, department head there, of working with these young people. He invites me in, and I talk to young people there. And I, you know, I've been to high schools and stuff. And it, what, what I find is that there's some young people that are, that, that love that challenge and see a positivity there. It's like, wow, you know, this work is urgent. It matters. It's something that I can make a difference in. It's something that I can build a career around because these, these problems, these issues of such magnitude aren't going to be solved in the next couple of years. And so I can build a career career around it and and i can say that about collaboration you know we're not going to just collaborate for five or ten years and we're done we got it done we we can you know do this kind of thing we're we're, we're good we're, you know this is going to be ongoing even if we restore the forest even if we completely restore the health and the resiliency of our forest now we got to maintain them you you can't just walk away we're gonna to have to maintain that's the next step after restoration and and that is a career in itself as well so there is so much opportunity and, and if young people can embrace the opportunity and, 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 and love the challenge, the challenges of, of climate change, of, you know, wildfire, you know, uh, management and finding the solutions socially, building support and, you know, trying to keep um, that forward momentum without, you know, uh, you know, losing big towns like Republic and, and seeing infrastructure go away. I mean, you know, that is part of the crisis as well. Cause like I could say, who's going to do the work and uh, you know, that's, it can't be people in their sixties and seventies, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of us are going to, you know, retire. And uh, I would love to pass this on, you know, and, and pass the torch and know that the next generation has got, you know, the reins and we'll take it from here. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's really good. And boy, I mean, I, I, we, we've been going for almost an hour here and I, I could sit and talk to you for, you know, hours and hours and lots of different things <laughs> Me to, too. Uh, Me too. go over and talk about forestry collaboration, you know, the whole socioeconomic things, legislative, the whole bit, but, I I kind of want to I want to end on uh maybe a, a little bit of a shift in that you know recently a a friend of both yours and mine passed away um his name was Maurice Williamson uh, he was a a longtime forest consulting forester up in northeast Washington 
Um, some would view him as a bit of a cantankerous, uh, grumpy, grumpy old guy. Um, but that's quite honestly a lot of uh, what I loved about Maurice. And uh, I think what was, you know, actually really helpful um, at, at, at those very unique times where you needed somebody to kind of be grumpy and blunt. But I think maybe you've got a couple kind of maybe funny stories about pranks that Maurice may have pulled on you or just any stories (laughs) you may want to share about Maurice. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity, Matt. I really want to pay a tribute to Maurice, Maurice Williamson, uh, consulting forestry and in Colville. He, he was a consultant for many, many years and, way back when he was a, a forester for the Republic uh, sawmill <laughs> back in the fifties and sixties, I guess. Anyway, way back then somewhere. And um, so I always respected what he had to say. He was the kind of guy that was gruff, like you said, and, and, you know, just comes across really blunt. Um, and yet when Maurice spoke, people listened and uh, he was well-read uh, and, and had so much experience and what I did love about uh, Maurice is he would come in to our meetings and meeting with the Forest Service and the Forest Supervisor and their staff and, you know, just just lay it out on the table. Here's what the problem is. And and he would be blunt about it. He, and he'd always start with, I'm just an old, you know, cantankerous old man, you know, and I may be getting senile and, you know, but this is what I think is going on. And he'll just lay the problem right in front of us clearly and then we got to look at it and face it and try to resolve it where the rest of us were always so diplomatic and dancing around you know the 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 issues and maurice would just set it up for us to 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 focus on what really matters and 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 that was valuable even though he was you know sometimes you know stepped on toes or whatever else he just he just knew that somebody had to say it and somebody had to do it. And and uh, I appreciated that so much. But boy, did he mess with me. I worked with him, you know, for, you know, like I say, 20 years or 18 years anyway at Boggan Brothers and and on the Northeast Washington Forestry Coalition. And and, uh, you know, we had a lot of good times together and and uh, I'll miss him forever. And uh, and and, you know, he would get me good every once in a while. And, and one time we were at the Society of American Foresters Conference. Um, in Post Falls, Idaho. And uh, I think there was about 75, 80 people there. And we were all, you know, having the social hour and about ready sitting down for dinner. And uh, Maurice had his right-hand man uh, at his consulting firm, you know, Brett Winterrude, go up to the podium and make an announcement that Lloyd McGee is buying a round of drinks for everyone and just go line up, you know, at the bar and, 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 you know, as you can, and just give them your first and last name and, and you'll get a drink. And I'm sitting there at the table and I'm just going, what? <laughs> I never said that. And everybody's coming up to me and pat me on the back. Thanks, Lloyd. That was really cool. You know, it was really cool of you to do this, you know, and I'm just thinking that I, I'm not going to pay for this tab, you know, and I, I mean, I'm not going to pay for it out of my pocket. And especially I don't, think I can put it on my expense account for Vaughan Brothers. Yeah. And and Maurice just comes up to me, he's just looking at me and laughing. And I'm just going, that was not cool. And and uh sure enough, it ended up being like a four hundred dollar tab and and Maurice paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the credit and he paid for it. <laughs> yeah. So that's no, the kind I, of guy he was. <laughs> yes. I mean I I I miss him as well. And you know, I, I think that was always you know, it, he, it was a personality that you had to really kind of take time to learn and understand how he, you know, would engage in groups. But, you know, you're, you're right. He always seemed to, they, they weren't always words I may, may want to repeat, but he always found a way to kind of, you know, get the message out there and get the group thinking and, and moving forward and, you know, and just say what's on his mind. And um, to this day, there are a few phrases that he uh, had shared with me that even my wife and I still use. Um, and we chuckle <laughs> and think about Maurice. So, um, yeah, yeah I will definitely miss him and the influence he had on not only collaboration, but just forestry in general. And uh, 
I'm, I'm glad to, that I got a chance to know him and, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll miss him and we'll, we'll raise a toast to him at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, could I, um, also before we finish, you know, sh uh, share a little bit about the upper Wenatchee pilot project and yeah, you know, yep. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I was going to actually just say, is there anything else that you want to share, talk about, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I know that we got to come to an end here pretty quick, but I'll just wanted to give a little plug about our collaborative, the Norris Central Washington Forest Health Collaborative. And and Maurice was uh, working with us at that time representing the AFRC. Um, and and uh, that was in 2015. Um, we had uh, the biggest wildfire situation in, in Washington state history. And uh, we burned over a million acres um, of wildfire that was both shrub step and, and forests. And uh, it was uh, overwhelming. And um, we had mainly big fires during that year, um, that summer of 2015 and, uh, around Lake Chelan and Lake Chelan in, in the County of Chelan. And, and, uh, you know, we, I forget what the magic number was that was spent on wildfire suppression, but, you know, it was ridiculous amount of money. I mean, it was in the millions, obviously high millions, <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and DNR spent that funding as well not just feds. And uh, so at that time we had a, um, a wildfire and us forum in uh, Wenatchee and about 400 of the community showed up, 400 people. And we had the, the um, you know, the forest supervisor was there and the lands commissioner was there. And, and, and uh, we all heard the private landowner, private people, you know, just saying, why isn't the Forest Service doing something about this? Why isn't there more work being done on the ground to, to you know, get these lands uh, under management so it won't burn like this? And um, so the Public Lands Commissioner at the time, Peter Goldmark, re reached out and wanted to know how we could get a pilot project on the ground, you know, to show the people that we're trying to do something big. And so they approached the North Central Collaborative and the question was, uh, do we know of any pilot project that would be, you know, impactful? And we had an idea going, and that was uh, Upper Wenatchee, uh, around Lake Wenatchee. And uh, it, it ended up being, uh, well, it was 30,000 acres at first, and we combined two more watersheds and made it a 75,000 acre planting area. And, uh, and the, it wasn't really on the Forest Service books at that time, but we wanted to move it up uh in the timeline and and uh you know the staff and the ranger district didn't have the capacity to take on such a big landscape for nepa planning so um we realized we we're going to have to hire a contracted nepa team we're gonna have to contract you know specialists that, that's not gonna be cheap and uh, so what we did is we put together a proposal over christmas break and uh by january 8th we were uh going around shopping that proposal to try to get grant funding or some sort of funding. And um, we went to Washington, D.C., and we went to the regional office in Portland. And ultimately, we had the DNR who was going to fund it if the feds wouldn't. That was, you know, kind of the thinking at that time. But we got, um, uh, you know, we, we actually ended up getting federal funding at the tune of uh, – 2.16 million dollars and that came from the supplemental hazardous fuels funds and uh, that wasn't even a competitive proposal we just shopped it ourselves and and uh, we got contract in NEPA and the long story uh, is too much to tell but we shortened it I'll shorten the story by 2017 we got the funds here we are now just starting the implementation on the ground. It's taken that long to get through all the consultation uh, for the Fish and Wildlife Service and the NOAA Marine Fisheries because of the LSR late successional reserves for spotted owls and all the salmon habitat. It's taken us this long, and we're hoping that this summer will not be the summer that the Upper Wenatchee landscape will burn because if we can get through this season, ideally we're going to get several projects go on in the next 10 years and really get a lot um, of fuel reduction and a lot of good management around some critical landscapes, you know, in one of the highest risk uh, fire sheds in 
in the in all of the Cascades, you know, both Oregon and, and Washington. We have the highest risk up here in uh yeah, uh, up in the upper Wenatchee area. And so we're really hoping that, you know, by the collaboration of our work, going out there and getting the funds and getting another big project on on the uh on the books that we're moving the needle and we're still waiting to see if, if if that's a fact but that took a lot of um a lot of go power from a lot of partners and i i, I just want to say all the partners and and the forest service i appreciate all the work that went into it and uh boy does it take patience that's why you can build a career around collaboration because it's it just moves at the speed of trust and that's what we've had to learn from the timber wars that collaboration moves at the speed of trust and once we build the trust and we can support each other we can we really can move mountains that lloyd i think is a great way to end it is with that hey. quote um and i want to thank you i i will note for the audience i will put a whole list of different links um in the show notes um i know that the north central i believe has a website i know newfic does there's collaboration resources on the forest service websites i'll find out so any other good ones on the nature conservancy's websites and uh put some links in the show notes for those that want to learn more about collaboration and any of these projects and just want to thank you for your time and i i i, I envision a future conversation at some point um in the future about more about forestry and collaboration. I would really appreciate that again, Matt, because I really enjoyed this. And, and this is the first time I ever told that story. Um, in, in 2025, it'll be 50 year anniversary for my forestry career. I started in 1975 and, and I don't want it to end. <laughs> well, there's too much, too much good work to do and too many good people to, to leave, leave behind. I don't want to do that. Definitely. Well, you, you stay at it. Thank you. And uh, hopefully it'll be before 2025, but we'll make sure we get a date <laughs> to celebrate the uh, 2025 50 year anniversary of your forestry career. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be around. So yeah, anytime. I'd love to keep on our, our on our chats. That would be great. Sounds great. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Matt. Bye.